This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Robert Browning by G. K. Chesterton. Section 5. Chapter 2. Early Works. Part 1. In 1840, Sordello was published. Its reception by the great majority of readers, including some of the ablest men of the time, was a reception of a kind probably unknown in the rest of literary history, a reception that was neither praise nor blame. It was perhaps best expressed by Carlyle, who wrote to say that his wife had read Sordello with great interest, and wished to know whether Sordello was a man, or a city, or a book. Better known, of course, is the story of Tennyson, who said that the first line of the poem, Who will, may hear Sordello's story told, and the last line, Who would, has heard Sordello's story told, were the only two lines in the poem that he understood, and they were lies. Perhaps the best story, however, of all the cycle of Sordello legends is that which is related of Douglas Gerald. He was recovering from an illness, and having obtained permission for the first time to read a little during the day, he picked up a book from a pile beside the bed and began Sordello. No sooner had he done so than he turned deadly pale, put down the book, and said, My God, I'm an idiot. My health is restored, but my mind's gone. I can't understand two consecutive lines of an English poem. He then summoned his family and silently gave the book into their hands, asking for their opinions on the poem, and as the shadow of perplexity gradually passed over their faces, he heaved a sigh of relief and went to sleep. These stories, whether accurate or no, do undoubtedly represent the very peculiar reception accorded to Sidello, a reception which, as I have said, bears no resemblance whatever to anything in the way of eulogy or condemnation that has ever been accorded to a work of art before. There had been authors whom it was fashionable to boast of admiring, and authors whom it was fashionable to boast of despising. But with Sordello enters into literary history the browning of popular bandage, the author whom it is fashionable to boast of not understanding. Putting aside for the moment the literary qualities which are to be found in the poem when it becomes intelligible, there is one question very relevant to the fame and character of Browning, which is raised by Sordello when it is considered, as most people consider it, as hopelessly unintelligible. It really throws some light upon the reason of Browning's obscurity. The ordinary theory of Browning's obscurity is to the effect that it was a piece of intellectual vanity, indulged in more and more insolently as his years and fame increased. There are at least two very decisive objections to this popular explanation. In the first place, it must emphatically be said for Browning that in all the numerous records and impressions of him throughout his long and very public life, there is not one iota of evidence that he was a man who was intellectually vain. The evidence is entirely the other way. He was vain of many things, of his physical health, for example, and even more of the physical health which he contrived to bestow for a certain period upon his wife. From the records of his early dandyism, his flowing hair, and his lemon-colored gloves, it is probable enough that he was vain of his good looks. He was vain of his masculinity, his knowledge of the world, and he was, I fancy, decidedly vain of his prejudices, even, it might be said, vain of being vain of them. But everything is against the idea that he was much in the habit of thinking of himself in his intellectual aspect. In the matter of conversation, for example, some people who liked him found him genial, talkative, anecdotal, with a certain strengthening and sanative quality in his mere bodily presence. Some people who did not like him found him a mere frivolous chatterer, afflicted with bad manners. One lady, who knew him well, said that though he only met you in a crowd and made some commonplace remark, you went for the rest of the day with your head up. Another lady, who did not know him and therefore disliked him, asked after a dinner party, who was that too exuberant financier? These are the diversities of feelings about him. 
but they all agree in one point that he did not talk cleverly or try to talk cleverly as that proceeding is understood in literary circles he talked positively he talked a great deal but he never attempted to give that neat and aesthetic character to his speech which is almost invariable in the case of the man who is vain of his mental superiority when he did impress people with his mental gymnastics it was mostly in the form of pouring out with passionate enthusiasm whole epics written by other people which is the last thing that the literary egoist would be likely to waste his time over we have therefore to start with an enormous psychological improbability that browning made his poems complicated from mere pride in his powers and contempt of his readers there is however another very practical objection to the ordinary theory that browning's obscurity was a part of the intoxication of fame and intellectual consideration we constantly hear the statement that browning's intellectual complexity increased with his later poems but the statement is simply not true. Sordello, to the indescribable density of which he never afterwards even approached, was begun before Strafford, and was therefore the third of his works. And even if we adopt his own habit of ignoring Pauline, the second, he wrote the greater part of it when he was twenty-four. It was in his youth, at the time when a man is thinking of love and publicity, of sunshine and singing birds, that he gave birth to this horror of great darkness. And the more we study the matter with any knowledge of the nature of youth, the more we shall come to the conclusion that Browning's obscurity had altogether the opposite origin to that which is usually assigned to it. He was not unintelligible because he was proud, but unintelligible because he was humble. He was not unintelligible because his thoughts were vague, but because to him they were obvious. A man who is intellectually vain does not make himself incomprehensible, because he is so enormously impressed with the difference between his reader's intelligence and his own, that he talks down to them with elaborate repetition and lucidity. What poet was ever vainer than Byron? What poet was ever so magnificently lucid? But a young man of genius, who has a genuine humility in his heart, does not elaborately explain his discoveries, because he does not think that they are discoveries. He thinks that the whole street is humming with his ideas, and that the postman and the tailor are poets like himself. Browning's impenetrable poetry was the natural expression of this beautiful optimism. Sardello was the most glorious compliment that has ever been paid to the average man. In the same manner, of course, Outward obscurity is, in a young author, a mark of inward clarity. A man who is vague in his ideas does not speak obscurely, because his own dazed and drifting condition leads him to clutch at phrases like ropes and use the formula that everyone understands. No one ever found Miss Marie Corelli obscure, because she believes only in words. But if a young man really has ideas of his own, he must be obscure at first, because he lives in a world of his own, in which there are symbols and correspondences and categories unknown to the rest of the world. Let us take an imaginary example. Suppose that a young poet had developed by himself a peculiar idea that all forms of excitement, including religious excitement, were a kind of evil intoxication. He might say to himself continually that churches were in reality taverns, and this idea would become so fixed in his mind that he would forget that no such association existed in the minds of others. And suppose that, in pursuance of this general idea, which is a perfectly clear and intellectual idea, though a very silly one, he were to say that he believed in Puritanism without its theology, and were to repeat this idea also to himself until it became instinctive and familiar. Such a man might take up a pen, and under the impression that he was saying something, figurative indeed, but quite clear and suggestive, write some such sentence as this. You will not get the godless Puritan into your white taverns. And no one in the length and breadth of the country could form the remotest notion of what he could mean. So it would have been, in any example, 
for instance, of a man who made some philosophical discovery and did not realize how far the world was from it. If it had been possible for a poet in the sixteenth century to hit upon and learn to regard as obvious the evolutionary theory of Darwin, he might have written down such such line as the radiant offspring of the ape, and the maddest volumes of medieval natural history would have been ransacked for the meaning of the illusion. The more fixed and solid and sensible the idea appeared to him, the more dark and fantastic it would have appeared to the world. Most of us, indeed, if we ever say anything valuable, say it when we are giving expression to that part of us which has become as familiar and invisible as the pattern on our wallpaper. It is only when an idea has become a matter of course to the thinker that it becomes startling to the world. It is worth while to dwell upon this preliminary point of the ground of Browning's obscurity, because it involves an important issue about him. Our whole view of Browning is bound to be absolutely different, and I think absolutely false, if we start with the conception that he was what the French call an intellectual. If we see Browning with the eyes of his particular followers, we shall invariably think this, for his followers are pre-eminently intellectuals, and there never lived upon the earth a great man who was so fundamentally different from his followers. Indeed, he felt this hardly, and even humorously himself. Wilkes was no Wilkite, he said, and I am very far from being a Browningite. We shall, as I say, utterly misunderstand Browning at every step of his career if we suppose that he was the sort of man who would be likely to take a pleasure in asserting the subtlety and obtuseness of his message. He took pleasure, beyond all question, in himself. In the strictest sense of the word, he enjoyed himself. But his conception of himself was never that of the intellectual. He conceived himself rather as a sanguine and strenuous man, a great fighter. I was ever, he says, a fighter. His faults, a certain occasional fierceness and grossness, were the faults that are counted as virtues among navvies and sailors and most primitive men. His virtues, boyishness and absolute fidelity and a love of plain words and things, are the virtues which are counted as vices among the aesthetic prigs who pay him the greatest honor. He had his more objectionable side, like other men, but it had nothing to do with his literary egotism. He was not vain of being an extraordinary man. He was only somewhat excessively vain of being an ordinary one. The Browning, then, who published Sordello, we have to conceive, not as a young pedant anxious to exaggerate his superiority to the public, but as a hot-headed, strong-minded, inexperienced, and essentially humble man, who had more ideas than he knew how to disentangle from each other. If we compare, for example, the complexity of Browning with the clarity of Matthew Arnold, we shall realize that the cause lies in the fact that Matthew Arnold was an intellectual aristocrat, and Browning an intellectual democrat. The particular peculiarities of Sordello illustrate the matter very significantly. A very great part of the difficulty of Sordello, for instance, is in the fact that, before the reader even approaches to tackling the difficulties of Browning's actual narrative, he is apparently expected to start with an exhaustive knowledge of that most shadowy and bewildering of all human epics, the period of the Guelph and the Ghibelline struggles in medieval Italy. Here, of course, Browning simply betrays that impetuous humility which we have previously observed. His father was a student of medieval chronicles, he had himself imbibed that learning in the same casual manner in which a boy learns to walk or to play cricket. Consequently, in a literary sense, he rushed up to the first person he met and began talking about Eccolo and Torello Salinguera with about as much literary egotism as an English baby shows when it talks English to an Italian organ grinder. Beyond this, the poem of Sordello, powerful as it is, does not present any very significant advance in Browning's mental development on that already represented by Pauline and Paracelsus. Pauline, Paracelsus, and Sordello stand together in the general fact that they are all, in excellent phrase, 
used about the first by Mr. Johnson Fox, confessional. All three are analyses of the weakness which every artistic temperament finds in itself. Browning is still writing about himself, a subject of which he, like all good and brave men, was profoundly ignorant. This kind of self-analysis is always misleading, for we do not see in ourselves those dominant traits strong enough to force themselves out in action which our neighbors see. We see only a welter of minute mental experiences, which include all the sins that ever were committed by Nero or Sir Willoughby Pattern. When studying ourselves, we are looking at a fresco with a magnifying glass. Consequently, these early impressions which great men have given of themselves are nearly always slanders upon themselves, for the strongest man is weak to his own conscience, and Hamlet flourished to a certainty even inside Napoleon. So it was with Browning, who, when he was nearly eighty, was destined to write with the hilarity of a schoolboy, but who wrote in his boyhood poems devoted to analyzing the final break-up of the intellect and soul. End of section 5